Hey folks, come on here, come on. At your service. And please, if you've got one of these or something similar, please raise it now to one of cinema's greatest and most beastly of lycanthropes, Oliver Reed. Raising hell wherever he is right now. Cheers, y'all. Yeah, in his first starring role, first major starring role, playing Leon, the afflicted Spaniard. Cursed by being born to a mute servant girl who's been raped by a, a beggar man. Um, and born on Christmas Day, which European superstition held that that was an unwanted child born on Christmas Day. That's an insult to the heavens. So, he's going to be afflicted with werewolfry. And indeed he is. And he becomes one of, one of the best screen monsters. It's an iconic role, an iconic look. Hammer's film caused a lot of you know, consternation with its lurid spectacle of rape, murder, revenge, and all sorts of beastly, hairy, skullduggery do. And uh, it's great. You're hearing Benjamin Frankel's awesome score for this great film directed by Terence Fisher, 1960. Although it did, because it got a bit of controversy with the BBFC, it languished till 1961 before being properly released. And then critics actually gnashed away at it, but it's now recognized as an absolute milestone within the genre. And of course, Hammer's supreme makeup artist, Roy Ashton, was the guy tasked with changing Oliver Reed, already a beast of a man, a barely hulking, intense, you know, very brooding, very overconfident and somewhat arrogant actor, but a great, great star power charisma with such a soulful intensity burning in his eyes. But he had that sort of lupine, wolfish look already. And playing Leon, you know, he skips off from his adoptive father, or I think he calls him uncle, Don Alfredo, played by the great Clifford Evans. And uh, he skips down towards another part of Bray Studios, which is done up so fantastically as this little Spanish rural hamlet with a big church, taverns, bars, all sorts of things in there. Lots of ruse for him to go cavorting across in the big explosive finale. But he becomes a wonderful character. And the film itself, with its great introduction with Richard Wordsworth, another hammer stalwart, as the beggar, the lovely beggar who goes up to the sadistic Marquis, 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 Mar the guy in charge of the area, and uh, who's called Marquis Sinestro. It's sinister. And they make a mockery of him, and they throw him in the dungeons, and they, he's left, you know, to languish in his own putrescence. And a little servant girl comes in to feed him scraps. And over the years, the little servant girl becomes the beautiful Yvonne Romaine, who, the evil Marquis, who has this horrible pasty zits all over his face and horrible acne, which Roy Ashton has painstakingly festooned him with. Incidentally, one of the shots the BBFC vehemently wanted removed was a shot of him picking one of the scabs off from his own face. Anyway, he puts the moves on uh, the servant girl and she rebuffs him. So she's held into the dungeon as well, alongside the guy that she used to feed out of sympathy. But he's changed years of being abused and just he's degenerated into... Well, he always was meant to be a werewolf. And the guy playing at Richard Wordsworth was actually fitted with fangs for a while, but the fangs didn't work so well, so they ended up removing that from the movie. So he ends up raping it, and in the process, all that excitement for such an old guy, he croaks, and she becomes pregnant. She kills the Marquis in a fit of revenge, stabbing him to death in another BBFC sensor baiting sequence. Uh, for a long time, mostly unseen, she flees, and eventually she falls into the the lovely embrace of Don Alfredo and his wife, who take her in, look after her, she gives birth Christmas Day, and she dies. So poor little Leon, and the little lad they get playing the young Oliver Reed 
is absolutely the young Oliver Reed. And he's brilliant. He's got a lovely little captivating voice, especially when he's saying that he's had, he has these dreams of running away with the wolves. And, you know, he remembers a little squirrel was shot by Don Pepe, who was the gamekeeper. And he picked it up, tried to kiss it better so it come back to life, but tasted the blood. And he began to want to taste more of the blood. And Don Alfredo was like, uh-oh, you're born on Christmas Day, an unwanted child. Uh, the priests have told him as well, like, that demons, demon spirits are abroad, especially on Christmas Day. And they don't want to inhabit the body of someone who's about to die, because that's going to be a dead husk of a body. They want someone who's just been born into the world, and then they can take over that form. And, of course, a wolf spirit, a demonic wolf spirit, has entered Leon. And yes, he does become a werewolf. As a little lad, he's gone out and he's taken out lambs and sheep and, and the odd kitten. But love is what restores him to just normality and makes the hairs on the palms of his hands disappear throughout most of the movie. But when he grows up to be Oliver Reed and he walks off into the big wide world just down the road, gets a job in a, in a vineyard and he falls in love with Christina, this lovely girl played by Catherine Fellows or oh, Fellows let me just check on that Catherine Feller yeah that was almost there uh, and then a little ill-fated trip to a bordello in town with his workmate who looks just like a young Boris Johnson yeah and when you see him prancing around with all the harlots and the huzzies flamenco dancers because don't forget this is Spain um, he his libido for the full moon as well unleashes the beast all over again this film was actually based on Guy Endor's novel The Werewolf of Paris but because Hammer had bought the rights to that story but they were also trying to do a film called The Rape of Sabine which was a Spanish set story but they did not get the okay to do that movie even though they built the sets for it at Bray Studios so we thought, well, hang on a minute, let's just take the story of the werewolf of Paris and just convert it from Paris to Spain. We've got the sets there, and the film was born. Anyway, we're not really here to discuss the movie, although you know what I'm like. We're here to discuss the marvellous makeup of Roy Ashton and how it's been translated into this incredible mask from Trick or Treat Studios as part of this big stampede of latex lunacy which is taking over the world during the Halloween season. We've waited a long time for these masks. They were all touted at the start of the year and we'd seen prototype imagery and then finally, finally they arrive. I've reviewed the mummy mask, the Christopher Lee mummy mask again from Hammer uh, and I've reviewed the Wolfman mask, Lon Chaney Jr. from the original 1941 Wolfman. Roy Ashton of course, is pretty much following the whole uh, Jack P. Pierce, Universal's makeup guy. He's following on from that. He's evolving it, as you could say. Now, this is Oliver Reed in his full hair suit, bedecked, rampaging beast mode. In one of his transformations, well, you really only see one transformation take place. The classic sequence where he's got himself flung into jail because he knows he's a killer and he's begging, you know, everyone, please, you've got to kill me, you've got to do it. Um, there's silver bullets are involved, there's lots of talk of be being burned alive, but Don Alfredo doesn't want to do that to his adoptive son. So Don Pepe's got a silver bullet. Yes, melt it down from a crucifix, no less. We can use that if we have to. But the love of a good woman should be able to bring you back to normal. Although, stupidly, he went off with a bad woman. And it definitely brought out the beast in him. So, Roy Ashton actually went to the zoos to study wolves. He did lots of sketches, he took pictures, he studied them and analysed them. You know, the way their eyes moved, the way their mouths moved, their snout, their muzzle, their ears moved. And he thought, I... I must bring that to this makeup. But I don't know about you folks. 
I am not seeing much of a real life wolf there. However, I am seeing, especially when you look at it from that side, from the, the profile, Oliver Reed. Now, what we've got here, Casey Wong has done this for Trick or Treat Studios, and it is a super, superlative bang up job. He's captured ev every part of that makeup is here, and I'll go through it. In reality, the makeup was an entire headpiece for Oliver Reed, which the nose and the top lip, and then the forehead, and then all the way around the back of the head. And then yak hair, yes, yak hair. Everyone who wants to be a werewolf must bedeck themselves with yak hair, and lots and lots of it. So, this on Oliver Reed would be yak hair. Um, he had contact lenses too, but the contact lenses, he had a very bad reaction to them. So in a lot of scenes of the werewolf read, he's not wearing the contact lenses. The nose had plugs in it to, as you can see, he's got like a boxer's pugilist nose, big flared nostrils, and it's widened. But there were plugs shoved up there to do that, and little holes drilled in so he could breathe through them. Unpleasant again. He has the long chainy underbite. Look at that. But it's a bit more effective this time around. You know, the fangs are really far more pronounced. And it's nice and bloody round here as well. Let's look at that. Look at that. You've got holes in here too. So, again, you can breathe. There's holes in nostrils, holes in the mouth, and obviously holes in the eyes. So you can see. Um, we have the ears up top here. Far more pointed and far more prominent than what you saw on Lon Chaney in his Wolfman makeup. And they're really good. Really good. One of the uh, distinctive features about the makeup was the fact that he had this sort of bashed in snout face with the jutting lower jaw and these pointed ears and this lovely luxurious sort of grey thatch of fur. So you've got this wiry grey stuff and the, the coverage on the mask is terrific. As I said with the Wolfman mask, um, the hair is not stitched in. I have to go and check again. I've had it for a couple of days. I, I keep forgetting. It's not stitched through. It's not punched through. But it is adhered in strips. But it's done really well. There is no gaps. There is no alopecia. There is no little bits of baldiness. It's a very good, fine, matted covering. And it do that is the look. This silvery grey sort of shot through with strands of white and differing shades of grey giving it this kind of very silvery effect that's exactly how it looks in the movie you've got these fabulous sort of lumpy muscle muscle bits on the forehead not exactly sure where that comes from in a wolf you know but it is striking that moment i said in the in the cell where the great michael ripper uh, who's in so many hammer movies plays the town drunk and he happens to be so unfortunate he's in the jail cell with yours truly when and he, he sits there looking at the cell window and Oliver he's like shaking there like he's saying you know it's getting dark it's going to be a lovely night the moon's growing it's going to be full and bright and he's oh no no it's happening and you, you do see his hands transform and it's a even Jack Pierce and um, oh, is it John P. Fulton who did the uh, the phot photographic effects for the Universal movies, the early vintage ones. Uh, even their stop motion, or sorry, frame by frame advance and dissolves of the fair is better than what they came up with in Hammer. They're two wooden hands that don't move, that get darker and darker and hairier and hairier. But the fact that they don't move and they clearly are just wooden hands does let the scene down. However. When he starts convulsing, and Michael Ripper's like sort of like looking, you know, are you all right over there? And suddenly Oliver Reed turns around. He's not completely fared up, but the ears are starting to sprout, and he turns around and you just see that oh, looking at him, and he's like, oh my god, he gets killed as well. And it's safe to say that unlike Lon Chaney's Wolfman, who only actually kills, I think, one person. Several die in the movie, but he only actually kills one um, in that first movie. Oliver Reed's Leon, the werewolf, kills about five people. And his first night, he kills three, including his, his 
the Boris Johnson lookalike, who he actually picks up and throws against the wall. <laughs> this is a very acrobatic werewolf. The entire finale, after he breaks out of the, uh, the cell after killing Michael Ripper and then killing the jailer as well, by literally forcing the door on him and then devouring him off camera, he then goes on the rampage around the town. And of course, the universal and hammer stalwart of torch-wielding villagers are hell-bent on catching him. Don Alfredo has got the silver bullet. Christina is there trying to, you know, well, I don't know what she's trying to do because she, didn't, she ain't going to win him back when he's in this mood. And he's leaping from rooftop to rooftop. He's climbing. I never really figured that out. Why not just run into the crowd? You've got claws and teeth and fangs. Just gnash at them. You'll take a few out. But no, and it's a lot of it is Oliver Reed doing these stunts. He's literally jumping around and climbing over roofs, jumping from one bit to another, climbing up into the uh, the belfry of the church, where they start ringing the bells to try and drive him mad. And it is, it's a really thunderously yeah, exciting finale. But just watching him leaping around, there's also that first night of kills in the town where he kills a prostitute, then he kills his friend as well, and then he kills this other guy who's wandering around, slightly drunk, and you see it in a lovely camera shot that he's on the roof following him, and you can hear him. <laughs> this guy is drunk, and he's thinking, oh, there's something up there. The camera follows him, and he goes off in that direction. The camera sort of looks up, and whether it's the stuntman or it's Oliver Reed, because you don't quite know, literally leaps off the roof onto him and literally leaps down from the roof head first that, that's quite a good stunt and we know that Oliver Reed and uh, I think it was Jack, Jackie Jackie Kelly was the, uh, the stunt man on it but Oliver Reed did a hell of a lot of his own stunts he was a very very physical guy now let's look at the mask again that profile is excellent the only thing I would say is that this jaw should jut out even more because the face does have this stoved in look. There is no snout. Roy Ashton did try to fabricate the upper lip to make that more pronounced, to give it the effect of a snout. But the fact that he's bludgeoned in the nose and made it a boxer's type you know, profile belies that completely. But in many, many shots and in the movie when you see him, you know, that jawbone, that lower jawbone really juts out all the more. Now, you could put this on display and you could easily do that. You could force that out a bit more to give it that look. But the nose is spot on. I say I'm loving these weird sort of raspberry ripple striations there. Loving the eyes. The eyes are fabulous. Now, you may notice this. The fairy little ladders either side of the bridge of the nose. Now, they are in the film, and it may that they put them on here. But you know why they're there in the film? I told you that's an appliance. You know, a skull cap, which then came down over the forehead and the nose and the top lip. But the fair there in the movie is to hide the seams where his real skin and eyes will begin. So that's why they're there. And in the film, they're far more subtle than what you have here. But don't get me wrong, I like that. Um, to be more authentic, you would have to trim those down a bit. But, you know, I do like the fact that they're there. The detail you have on the teeth, the fangs, is phenomenal. I love the blood dripping down into the fair. That's terrific. And it was Oliver Reed's friend, who was a dentist, that they actually got in to, to make these fangs. He said, oh, I know someone who can do this for you. So Roy Ashton's job was halved there. But the leathery skin is wonderful. Same with the Wolfman. It's perhaps a little bit too severe. You know, the outline of the fair line. You could play with that. You could try to bring some of the fair in around, you know, the, the darker patch of the, uh, the adhesive. But it, it is a lovely, still a lovely effect. The contrast from the fair to the flesh is still great and vivid and bold. The shadowing around here, around the mouth, is exquisite. The sort of the, the grimace and the expression is what you see in the film. But I'm going to say that 
face on, you don't see Oliver Reed there. That way round, you do. That way round is, apart from that should shut out a bit more, that's really, really good. That's perfect almost. And again on that side, it's just this doesn't seem, unless you, you get your angles right, I don't know, I don't know. It still is fabulous. It's a tremendous work of beastly art. And as I say, the, the hair coverage is terrific. The paint work is great. The sculpt is magnificent. Let's put it on. Because I've got my flamboyant gothic shirt on. The big billowy white shirt, which he rips asunder and then runs around the town with it just hanging in shreds off him. And it's also the first time that you saw a fairy body of a werewolf as well. And he, because Oliver Reed had that kind of brawniness to him as well, and this sort of grey hair sprouting everywhere, gave him a really sort of almost gypsy wrestling swarthy kind of look. Anyway, oh, before we go any further and go inside, um, I know people like this. There actually is some markings in here. We have the number where it was pulled off. An unfortunate expression, but it's a technical term. And it's 1668. So, 1668, this one is numbered at. Um, there's no actual initials, and there isn't the pumpkin stamp of trick or treat, but doesn't matter. Again, like the mummy mask, and like the wolfman mask, and like the mask you're going to see in the next video, which is the Curse of Frankenstein, um, it's actually quite a small mask. It may look big and huge, but once you're in it, it's a nice fit. For someone like me, you know, who's often dwarfed by these masks, it's nice to have these. As I said in the previous video, it's, it's almost like they've listened to what people have been saying. Oh, the masks are great, but they're just too big. You can't wear them. Well, these, this range that I've seen so far, have been phenomenal. So, without further ado, let's get in there. Is the bar open? I'm feeling very, very thirsty. Christina, it's me. It's Leon. I love you, Christina. Unlike the Wolfman mask, where you have to try to give some body and, and build and shape to the, the fair, it, should, it shouldn't be slipped back. This one actually benefits from being slipped back. You don't really want, when it arrived, the fair was up there like that, really sort of adding to the, the ear sort of pointiness, but that's not how it looks. <laughs> so you've really got to, well, and, and on my one anyway, I've had to spend a bit of time trying to flatten that down. Show you the ears again. The ears are really good. Yeah. The point isn't too severe, but you, you, but you get the point. They're pointy ears on top of his head. See what I mean about the, the bushiness of, of these bits? I think really, I may well trim those down a bit, just because that they shouldn't be as pronounced as that. But the eyes, you've got this hypnotic sort of look in the eyes. And you've got all of this red weepiness around here. This sort of livid quality. On the Lon Chaney Wolfman mask, they, they've given him, um, Jasper Anderson has, has given it bloodshot eyes. Which you don't see in the film. Bit of poetic license. I don't mind that at all. His eyes actually are bloodshot. But, weirdly enough... You can barely see that on this. Okay, all around the outside is this livid pink and red and crimson. 
blazing there. And you, but you've got this hypnotic look to the eyes, sort of like this around you know, the iris. You've got these sort of jagged sort of lightning sort of uh, pattern. But in the corners and the recesses, you do have a bit of blood there, but it's not so well pronounced. Ironically, in the film, Oliver Reed doesn't actually appear until the halfway mark as Oliver Reed. Up until then, he's just the little, the little kid. And he doesn't really transform until the final sort of 12 minutes when you actually see him in this. But then you see him a lot. So it's kind of weird. There's a great three-act structure to this movie. The first um, act is the, the mute servant girl and the beggar and the, the sadistic Marquis. And then you've got Leon growing up and picking off random sheep and lambs and things and causing all untold trouble in his sleepwalking or sleep stalking. And then you have the adult Leon. So it's quite an epic story for Hammer to, to unveil. And it's also told within a strict 90 minutes. And yet you've got bloodletting, you've got romance, you've got superstition, folklore, you've got religion brought into it. You've even got Peter Salis in there as the, the mayor of the town who doesn't believe a word of werewolfry until he sees it for himself. But it's a, it is a wonderful, wonderful mask. Casey Wong has really done a great job on this. And as I say, that profile is tremendous. You just need to get this lower jaw out a bit more to give it more of a sort of almost like a, a a stone age sort of cave caveman prehistoric man sort of look with this jutting underbite it fits great though the contours in this you know again i'm not sure what roy ashton was thinking with this i've never seen a wolf look like that he spent so long studying them but that's not what he came up with at the end of the day doesn't matter it's an iconic look. It would be copied as well. Ty Burns film, Legend of the Werewolf, which came out in the early 70s, with Peter Cushing in it as well, had David Rintoul in the sewers of Paris. And he looks just like this, only his fur is a lot whiter. Again, it's a very vivid, eye-catching look, very, you know, memorable. And obviously, werewolves from that point onwards would really sort of become the land of prosthetics and stretch show skin and all that kind of thing. The Howling and American Werewolf and untold countless pack mates since then. And in fact, that scene in the jail where he turns around like that and you just see that really. It, it almost looks like it's about to start pulsing and stretching and growing. This is the finale. Benjamin Frankel's epic score for this, this movie has pastorals, it has elegance, it has romance and it has this pulsating energy during this fabulously frenzied finale. So folks, this is Oliver Reed as Leon in full werewolf mode. It is fabulous. A great mask, it's very angry looking, it's urgh, he's, he's like Look, he means business. Unlike with the Lon Chaney one where there's genuine pathos in his eyes and tragedy and doom and fate, Oliver Reed conveys that when he's acting as Leon, but when he's the werewolf, he is pure and utter monster. He gets shot in the belfry at the end. You know, you think it's bad enough having a bat in your belfry, but when you've got one of these up there, but Don Alfredo sadly puts the bullet into him. And he convulses, oh, and he twists around, does a, you know, a, a flip in midair and rolls around in his death throes. And unusually, when Alfredo goes over to the body of his adoptive son, all sympathetic, he doesn't transform back into Leon. He stays in, in, his, in his beast form. That's an unusual slant, that. Very often you see them revert back to their human form, but not in this case. Terence Fisher directs with vigour and gusto as you'd expect. Set design is awesome, score is phenomenal, and the performances are all electrifying, none more so than Oliver Reed, who owns this role, even though he, he only comes into it halfway through. And Ashton's makeup is iconic. So folks, there you go. That's the second werewolf mask from this little little smorgasbord of latex that I've had arrived this week. 
So, folks, there he is. That is outstanding, that. And the mane is so great and so thick and luxurious. Wonderful. Folks, I have been and always shall be Kilt Man. I've got another mask for you in a day or so. So, in the meantime, and that lycanthropic in between time, be happy, be safe, just be yourselves. And I'm going to see you all. Whoosh.